Now, in every major city, these immigrants clustered together in immigrant ghettos. They lived among people like themselves, which is typically what immigrants tend to do. And they spoke their own languages. There was a little area of New York called Klein Deutschland, little Germany, where everything was German. The shops were in German. The language was in German. The signs were in German. The Irish clustered together. Um, they didn't try to exactly Americanize themselves. That is to say, cul culturally, um, culturally assimilate. They maintained their old culture. The, the, at least that's what historians tend to emphasize more now. The classic work on immigration in general was written many, many years ago by the scholar from Harvard, Oscar Handlin, called The Uprooted. The Uprooted, and the, story, the, the title tells the story. People are uprooted from one culture. Their lives are totally disrupted. They land here. They're, they, they're you know, suffering from anomie, disruption. They can't fit in, and eventually they get absorbed. 20, 30 years later, John Bodnar published a history of immigration with a very different point of view and title called The Transplanted. Not the uprooted, the transplanted. In other words, they brought their culture with them and just plunked it down in the United States. So it wasn't quite as disruptive and psychologically destructive a process as Handlin had uh, seemed to suggest. But most recently, I think what historians emphasize is what they call hybridity, the mixing of cultures. There is, there, 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 one of the better examples of this, this has nothing to do with the Civil War, but is a, a, a book by a fellow historian called George Sanchez on Mexican immigrants into Los Angeles area in the 20th century called Becoming American. And again, look at the titles, tell you something. Becoming, that's an active verb. That's like a process, a historical process. It's not just uprooting, it's not just transplanting, it's something that grows over time. Becoming American, it's a merger of cultures. Being Mexican-American is not being Mexican, and it's not quite being American yet, like all the other Americans. It's some kind of mixture of cultures, and it's a historical process. And one can add to that the fact that these it, it, taking, let's say, Ireland and America as two things is m historically misguided because neither of them is static. Ireland is changing rapidly in this period. So is the United States. Someone who immigrates from Ireland in 1830 is coming from a different place than someone who immigrates in 1860. And they're entering a different place. So it's not like there's just Ireland and America. They, both of them are undergoing a process of historical change. So that makes the study of this complicated, that's all. Um, so the Irish particularly become the target of anti-immigrant sentiment. They, uh, they cluster together in these very poor immigrant ghettos. They, Handlin's first book, long ago, the Boston Irish pointed out that they intermarried less with native-born Americans than any other kind of combination. More, and this wasn't a lot, more black and white people married together in Boston in the 1840s and 50s than Irish married non-Irish. And there weren't a heck of a lot of interracial marriages uh, at that time. Uh, the immigrant ghetto is closed by choice or lack of, lack of choice or by the larger society or some combination thereof. People want to live among familiar people. On the other hand, Many neighborhoods wouldn't let them live there at all, so they cluster in those places that they're sort of like African Americans when they moved up to New York City from the South. They wanted to live among people they knew, but most neighborhoods they couldn't live anyway, so you get these, um, these uh, ghettos uh, created. And then they discover that they are Irish here. See, this is another thing about immigration. There was no such thing as Ireland. There was a physical place. People didn't think, they, they were from Cork, they were from Kerry, they were from Donegal. People who came here were thrust into contact with other people from their same country who they never would have encountered except through the process of migration. It's actually the same with African Americans. People became African in America. 
They were not African in Africa. There was no such thing as being an African. There was something like being a, you know, a, 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 a member of some group, some tribe, some nation, whether Angola, Congo, Ife, you name it. All, I mean, there were dozens and dozens of places in Africa. It's just the same as Europeans. Do Frenchmen think they're the same as Germans or the Italians? No, of course not. Um, they still can't. I mean, they're still trying to create this European Union, and they're always at each other's throats. So it's in the United States, as, a, as part of the process of migration, that a more national consciousness is, is developed by people who are thrown together. The very process of migration is the seedbed of nationalism in many ways in the 19th and 20th centuries. And then nationalism is exported back. Irish radicals here export their view of Irish nationalism back to Ireland, just like Puerto Ricans brought Puerto Rican nationalism from this island, Manhattan, back to that island, Puerto Rico, and African nationalism. Martin Delaney, in the, we'll see later on, in the 1850s, black American is over exploring the Niger River Valley looking for a homeland for black Americans and talking about an African heritage, which is, which is a new thing, so to speak, in, in that kind of um, consciousness. Um, so anyway, this is a bit of a diversion. As a, as a result of immigration, or let us say associated with immigration, come a host of urban problems. Poverty, disease, criminality, slum conditions. In a way, the victim gets blamed for the results of having to live in slum-like ghettos, um, where disease is rife, poverty is rife, crime is rife. Immigrants live in very crowded conditions with poor sanitary facilities, high crime rates, high population density. Of course, the most famous such neighborhood in New York was called the Five Points, which was way downtown around where City Hall is today, but was notorious as a, it was more multi-ethnic. There were not only Irish, but other poor people, including blacks, living in the Five Points in the 1830s, the 1840s. Uh, it became so famous that it was a tourist attraction. Visitors to New York from Charles Dickens to Abraham Lincoln asked to come and see the Five Points. It was so notorious uh, uh, as, as, a as a dangerous sort of place where people lived. And certainly, um, the immigrants get associated with crime. Now again, crime statistics are very uh, difficult to use because the police choose who they want to stop and frisk, as we have in this city, or arrest. So the vast majority of people arrested in New York City in the 1850s were immigrants, Irish or German immigrants. Does that mean that native-born people weren't committing any crimes? Maybe. Or maybe it just means the police were there to police the immigrants and weren't worried so much about what native-born people uh, might be doing. And then the vast majority of those receiving public relief of one kind or another were also immigrants. So all of this feeds a sense that immigrants are somehow disrupting the society or creating urban problems for the society, um, et cetera. Um, and um, so the influx of immigrants is blamed for that and also for this rising, growing social stratification as they compete with native-born workers for jobs. They, their presence drives down labor uh, wages in, in many, uh, in many uh, areas, or unskilled particularly, where they're, where they're uh, competing for labor. Um, and they become a kind of permanent working class. As I say, the second generation doesn't move up very fast. Eventually, they do begin to experience upward social mobility, and they save money. Even, even like today, the poorest immigrants save an enormous amount of money. Today, they send a lot of it back to their countries of origins. Tyler Ambinder, a scholar uh, uh, who actually had his PhD here, uh, did a study recently of savings banks in New York in the 1850s, and he found a lot of the accounts were small accounts by Irish immigrants that even though they were paid very little, they still tried to save um, a little bit of money.